The Tom Wood Show, episode 2011. Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. Hi, everybody. Tom Woods here. I'm joined today by Jeff Deist, who is president of the Mises Institute. And he wrote a little something about Kyle Rittenhouse that I thought was pretty good and pretty important to talk about. So this is an interview that I recorded with him several days ago before we knew of the not guilty verdict. But we wouldn't have changed one word of this conversation had we known the verdict. It's the same thing. The analysis is the same. Because even if we speculate, well, let's see, if he's found guilty, then that means such and such. That's still relevant, obviously. Because as we know, it could just as easily have come out the other way. And what would that have meant? So I want you to understand, we didn't know what the outcome would be, but this is still a really good and important conversation that I think and hope you'll enjoy. So having said that, I now transfer you over here to my conversation with Jeff Deist. First of all, I want to thank you again for hosting the 2000th episode of The Tom Woods Show. You surprised me (laughs) with the way you opened it up and your humor and good-naturedness throughout the evening made it extra special. And my personal favorite line you had was almost a throwaway line. It was during Family Feud where we had brought up five random people from the audience and one of them was dressed in a very unusual kind of spaceman sort of costume. And he was playing a character. And he said, you know, I, I'm so-and-so from such-and-such. And, you know, again, playing this character. And he says, uh, you know, I think I walked into the wrong conference, but everybody's been great. And deadpan without missing a beat, as you were walking to the next contestant, you said, no, you walked into the right conference. <laughs> that, that, that's great. Yeah, no comment. <laughs> oh, man, it was like Doc Dixon chose the most, let's say, colorful people in the room to come up and play. Mm-hmm. And they beat us, you know, they, as it turns out, they beat Team Woods in that game. All right, well, now we have to talk about something rather more grim, and that's this Kyle Rittenhouse matter. And as we're discussing it, as we record this, there is no, I haven't checked today, Jeff, but I assume there's still no verdict. So by the time people hear this, there's a remote chance there could be one, but it doesn't really matter because the kinds of things we're going to be talking about, we would say, regardless of what the outcome is. So the gist of it, I assume almost all Americans know, but since maybe one out of five, one out of six listeners of the program is from another country and they're probably not following every story like this coming out of the U.S., how would you tell the story to somebody who hasn't heard it? Yeah, I think to anybody outside the U.S., this would be a uniquely American story. In other words, it would tell a tale of two very different views of the exact same events, right? So we have facts, we have unassailable facts, but we have very different perspectives on those facts. And what's, in my opinion, anyway, very unfortunate about all this is that resting on the shoulders of this kid, and he is a kid, Kyle Rittenhouse, I guess he's 17, I don't know if he's turned 18 in the interim, but nonetheless being tried as an adult apparently, is this idea that if he is acquitted, that shows that America is basically a country that is still deeply racist and has these white supremacist militia Trump types who can run around with an assault rifle so-called and involve themselves in a riot and shoot people and get away with it. And that shows you just how far America has yet to come. That's one narrative. The other narrative is that hey, you know, we have violent mobs burning down cities in the wake of both the George Floyd killing last year and also the killing in Kenosha, Wisconsin of Jacob Blake or the shooting of Jacob Blake. And so we can't just allow these mobs to go unfettered and the media is doing its awful best to make sure we don't know much about it and to downplay those things. While, of course, wildly exaggerating the so-called January 6th riot in the Capitol, and that, uh, you know, we need to get back to some sort of law and order in this country. And, and my comment on the second perspective, Tom, is that, look, we've had, you know, enormous riots in this country we, back in the 60s and 70s, for example. This is nothing new per se. What strikes me as new, though, is this official reaction to say, hey, local city councils, local mayors, local police departments, we're basically going to step back and allow these rioters to go unimpeded because effectively we're sympathetic to their underlying cause. 
You know, there really are a lot of racist police or police shootings of minorities or whatever it might be. And that strikes me as saying, well, you know, it's just property. They're just burning down property. And because their political grievance is legitimate, we're going to allow it to happen. That's very different. That's very different than saying, well, the police need to retreat because they're outgunned or outmanned, or we need to save this property, but not that property because we have limitations on our forces or whatever. You know, this, this strikes me. We saw it in Seattle. We saw it in Kenosha. We've seen it in Portland. This decision by police to let things burn and the left's response, which is it's just property, which is not as important as human life, and it's insured. They have insurance. This is very, very different because we, you know, property is not something that exists separate and apart from us. Property is the material and physical world in which we live our lives. And so when you start saying it's okay to destroy property because your political grievance is noble or righteous, then that's a very, very tough road to go down because then if you can burn down the car dealership, that's downtown, then maybe you can burn down the suburb. Maybe you can, you know, things get closer and closer to home. So at some point, we all live and exist in a material world of property, including buildings and land. And so when you allow people to riot unimpeded, you know, that sends a very bad message. And who's deciding? I guess that's the question. Who's deciding which political grievance or which riot is noble and righteous and which is not? And of course, this is why the rule of property is so helpful because it decides that question. It says it doesn't matter what your cause is. You can't damage property that doesn't belong to you. And so now you don't even have, we don't even have to sit here and adjudicate all these things. Not that it's particularly difficult to adjudicate them, but property adjudicates them. And this is one of the 800 million reasons that our tradition of libertarianism emphasizes property as being fundamental, not self-expression, not individualism. Not any, any of those things are subsidiary points that begin with property. They begin with the ownership of yourself and the ownership of whatever plot of land you're on or whatever. That's what it all is rooted in. And so when our you call them our left libertarian friends, I can't even jokingly call them friends, when they – downplay property, or we just don't hear that type of language coming from them. It's always self-expression, or it's instead of the non-aggression principle, it's we want to prevent harm, but harm's much more vague than the precise non-aggression principle. I'm not saying it leads to rioting, but it is part and parcel of the reigning ideology that thinks property is of secondary importance to other things. And of course you get a mentality that says, if you live in the United States today and you look at the propaganda that surrounds you everywhere, yeah, you think property is like nothing or it's property is something that greedy fat cats care about and they have insurance anyway, so we can just burn their buildings down. And they have insurance anyway. Well, number one, a lot of insurance is not going to make you whole after a riot. That's actually in the wording. But secondly, they won't continue to have insurance if they live in a place that now is perceived as being uninsurable or their premiums would be so high as to make marginal businesses just give up entirely. So it's incredibly childish to look at it that way. And then also, let's talk about this. They say, the way we can know that Rittenhouse was up to no good and was just being mischievous is that he had to get out and drive to another town, to drive to Kenosha. And that goes to show that he must have been looking for trouble. I mean, maybe maybe these people are saying that if it had been right outside his doorstep, maybe they might think differently, although I doubt it. I doubt it. But his father lived in Kenosha, for one thing. And another thing is, what were the rioters doing there? These people he killed came from an even greater distance. And they came in order to spread mayhem. I do not believe they came simply to express their opinion on a political topic. I'm sorry, I don't buy that. Yes, it's interesting to think about context. I mean, you think about the context in which a crime or an alleged crime takes place. And here it's Kyle Rittenhouse is alleged to have unjustly killed two people and I guess shot a third. So when we start to think about the context in which this happened, the riot itself, the circumstances – 
the hours leading up to it, where everybody came from, why they came there. It's almost like little concentric circles going out wider and wider, like you threw a pebble in a pond. And to decide something at a trial, we have to ask ourselves how much of this context ought to be considered or ought to be admissible as evidence in a trial. And in the American justice system, the answer has always been, well, only relevant evidence ought to be allowed in, not all this greater social justice context of what everyone's underlying cause is. And so when it comes to the charge of murder or other kinds of unlawful killing, in criminal law, there's a concept that intent can be formed in an instant. What we mean by that is that, you know, let's say somebody wants to decides to murder someone and spends several weeks planning it and goes out and procures a weapon and thinks about how they're going to do it. And we would obviously say that's premeditated murder. And that generally allows for the harshest criminal penalty, sometimes the death penalty in certain states. So that's premeditated. So we say, well, the intent is clear because of the actions of the defendant in making all these plans and preparation to kill someone. But intent can be formed in an instant means like, let's say you just went out to a bar one night and a bar fight ensues. And before you know it, you're caught up in it. In just an instant, it's thought anyway in American criminal law that you could pick up a bottle and smash somebody over the head with the intent to kill them. And that you can be charged for an intentional crime like murder rather than simply manslaughter, which is more of a reactionary or circumstantial crime because you decided to do that in an instant. Well, the same thing goes for self-defense. It doesn't really matter what led up to these three or four gentlemen all becoming intertwined on this leafy streets of Kenosha, Wisconsin, which, by the way, a lot of people are missing out on this. It's only a town of 100,000 people. That's like Auburn, Alabama. But the events leading up to it are irrelevant in the legal sense, or ought to be, in terms of determining whether he was legitimately acting in self-defense at that instant. I would argue based on what I know about this trial that he was, but uh, you know, I'm not on the jury. I haven't seen all of the trial or anything like that. So that's really what's so damaging, I think, about this trial is that we, and I, I'm guilty of this myself, we're looking at this in a broader context when it ought to be viewed really based on the specific instant facts on the ground, which happened there by a local jury. And the fact that it's being used as a proxy in the media for those two narratives that we mentioned earlier, you know, it's depressing, but I guess we're all invested in it in a sense. Yeah. And I, I mean, I would just invite people to consider, would you want to be in court involved in a case in which the entire country feels ideologically invested in the outcome? So it doesn't really have to do with you anymore. It has to do with this. Now, obviously, you have a judge and a jury, and the presumption is that they're insulated from these things. But I, I don't know. I mean, supposedly the Supreme Court is supposed to be the apolitical institution that's insulated from popular opinion, but it doesn't seem to work that way with the Supreme Court either. So let me ask this. It's true that we should treat this in the manner of Western justice. This is an individual who is being accused of certain things. We're going to bring some evidence and and we're going to talk to people. We're going to get to the bottom of what happened the best we can and render a judgment. But it's impossible at this point, Jeff, I think not to feel invested in the outcome in a broader sense, even though we shouldn't think of it that way. For example, if he's found guilty, what does that mean? If there are rampaging rioters in my city or even in a neighboring city that I happen to think it, you know, the, the people are a bunch of deadbeats going to let their city burn down. I, I want to try and stop that. If I get assaulted, I can't defend myself. Is that going to become a precedent? So that is a source of concern to all of us and not just, you know, the individual impact it has on Kyle and his family. Well, this is the idea here behind generalized or specific justice. If we all view it in a generalized sense, then yes, that causes us some concern over what amount of self-defense or defense of property is permissible in American society. Well, if he is found guilty, that would appear to shade it a little bit more against defending property using lethal force or against entering, you know, going to the trouble and then using self-defense once you find it. The flip side is also true when it comes to generalized justice. There are people who might say, you know, the broader cause of race relations in America is more important than the actual life circumstances of Kyle Rittenhouse. So even if he's 
you know, was sort of acting in self-defense at the moment. The bigger picture is more important. And so we ought to sacrifice him and throw him in jail for life or whatever the punishment would be in order to not give millions of blacks around the country. Yet another example of how there's two justice systems in this country, one for white people, one for black people. So it's more important to reassure the black folks in this country that we're making progress on racial justice and on uh, criminal justice than it is to save this kid. So who cares, even if he's not guilty, throw him in jail for the greater good of society, right? I mean, I, I think there, there are people who might entertain that argument. I also think there are people in Kenosha who might say, just throw him in jail so that we don't have another riot here. You know, I mean, that this is what happens when you start thinking about justice in generalized terms rather than specific terms. I mean, it can go anywhere. Hey, everybody, let's take a quick break for a sponsor message. We're getting very close to 2022, but there's no reason to wait until January 1st to make an important change in your life. The false impression you get on social media that everybody else has a perfect life and it's only you who has problems has done enormous damage to a lot of people because it's discouraged them from reaching out for the help they need. Trust me, those people's lives are not perfect and your life can be better. And that's why I recommend a service I myself have used, BetterHelp. BetterHelp assesses your needs, matches you up with your own licensed professional therapist. You can connect in a safe and private online environment. Super convenient. You can start communicating in under 24 hours. This is not self-help. It's professional counseling. And you can have phone or video sessions. No uncomfortable waiting rooms. It's available for clients worldwide. And whether it's depression or stress or anxiety or relationships or trauma or whatever it is that's standing between you and happiness, BetterHelp can help. I want you to start living a happier life today. As a listener, you'll get 10% off your first month by visiting betterhelp.com slash woods. Join over 1 million people taking charge of their mental health. Again, that's betterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash woods. I wonder, even though we know that the, dem well, let me start this again, because I was about to say, even though we know there aren't major differences between the Democrats and the Republicans, I'm not so sure that's really the case anymore. I mean, obviously, most Republican politicians are not worth anybody's time. Some things never change. But I would say there is a more clearer distinction between Democrats and Republicans today than there was in 1988 between George H.W. Bush and Michael Dukakis. I mean, come on. They had to do the whole death penalty Willie Horton thing to come up with something to differentiate the two of them. So I think it's clearer. There's At the very least, there's a clear distinction between the bases of the two. That is to say, the people who vaguely or maybe with some gusto affiliate with one party or another. These people, clearly, there's a hostility level between these two camps that I don't remember at any time in my life. So I guess what I want to know is, I find it extremely interesting that the Democrats, at this point, the Democrats are associated, rightly or wrongly, I think rightly, they're associated with riots and property destruction and making excuses for this. They're associated with the craziest, wackiest, most preposterous critical race theory stuff. They're associated with the idea that, uh, look, we'll tell you what your kids are going to learn because uh, we're the experts in charge. They're associated with locking you in your house, with crazy mandates that make no sense and that have nothing to do with the data. How do you sustain a party on this basis? I mean, when you look at Kyle Rittenhouse, if you had to sum it up in one sentence to somebody from Mars, you would sum it up as there were violent rioters in a city. This kid was unhappy about that and thought whether he should or not, he thought he should maybe try and do something about it. And in the course of doing so, in self-defense, he killed two of them. That is how you would describe it. That is what happened. And to think, well, my knee-jerk response is in favor of the rioters, I don't understand that. I don't understand that kind of person. And yet you have an entire political party based on – and not to mention, we don't even have to get into the transgender stuff. None of this is mainstream. Even in crazy left-wing America, it's not mainstream. How do they survive? I don't understand it. Well, the idea is that we're watching two different movies in America, or at least two different movies. And again, we have objective facts which occurred on the ground in this case, 
what happened in that moment on that evening in Kenosha. There are actually objective facts. Whether we can ascertain them perfectly or not, I don't know. But those facts exist. The two different movies are how we're all viewing those facts or how we're shading them or how they're being presented to us. And with social media, it's never been easier to just sort of consume your own narrative. So that's what's happening. When you say, how can the Democrats associate themselves with all these things and maintain themselves as a party? I think the answer is that they're up against a very feckless opponent in the Republicans. I mean, we can see that this newly elected governor in Virginia has already said that he's going to allow vaccine mandates. Uh, you know, I mean, he's already rolled over on that. So they're up against a very feckless party. And Republicans have never been able to do what seemingly should be very simple, which is to present themselves as the ownership and opportunity party, as opposed to the grievance and destruction party, because they're not, neither party is fully that, but I mean, that would be how you present it. So I, you know, I don't really have an answer to that, but this idea that we're watching two different movies, which a lot of people have made this point, you know, what's the answer to all this? Is the answer to keep having these high stakes, winner take all, federal elections to decide everything, a handful of Supreme Court justices, president and a few thousand administration members, some federal senators with undue power. I mean, is that really the way to run a country of 330 million people? It seems to me that the obvious answer staring all of us in the face is that we ought to see all this hostility and hatred as it's expressed through social media or otherwise and start making some conclusions about how we could ratchet that down with some sort of aggressive federalism or some sort of breakup of the country. I know this is a taboo subject for a lot of people, but given the alternatives, I'm not sure that we have a good answer. The vaccine mandate issue is, to me, the most important one in the country right now. Now, of course, we had that decision by the Fifth Circuit, and I devoted an episode of my show to going through it and combing through it to find the key points and it was pretty well argued. It wasn't argued in exactly the way I would argue it, but in the context of constitutional law in 2021, this is about the best you're going to get. Now, we're sitting here on pins and needles waiting to see what the next thing is, you know, what, because they've granted a stay and then they've affirmed that stay, but there's still more judicial review to be done. And so we're sitting here on pins and needles waiting to find out what the outcome is. And it's very, very unusual for people to stop and realize how abnormal this is, that we're sitting here waiting for a group, an infinitesimally small group of what Kevin Gutzman calls politically well-connected lawyers, which is what federal judges are, to make this decision that is of sweeping importance and significance for the lives of tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions of people. This cannot possibly be the only way we can organize society. So to me, it is important, as you said, Jeff, to talk about the breakup of the country and to talk about it frequently to make it into an ordinary topic of conversation. And incidentally, this is how the left gets its victories. You know, for the official organized LGBTQ movement got what they wanted by taking topics that were not being discussed by anybody and suddenly making them discussed by everybody. Now, the difference is the left has the culture and the institutions on its side. So it's a lot easier to suddenly bring up a taboo subject when absolutely everybody in the opinion molding class agrees with you. But they did it at least. And likewise, that's what we need to do is start talking about it and talking about it because it, after a while it becomes clear that there is no political solution at this point. There is nothing we can do when you have... It's one thing if one side thinks the taxes should be 30% and the other side thinks they should be 34 and then they make them 31.8 and nobody's completely happy, but they can live with it. We're long past that. Well, and the Rittenhouse trial shows this. It's not just about a young man who shot some people. The Kyle Rittenhouse trial is now an indirect proxy for vaxxers versus anti-vaxxers, lockdowners versus anti-lockdowners, pro-Trump MAGA versus anti-Trump, red state deplorables versus blue state, you know, intellectuals. It's a proxy for everything. How you view the Kyle Rittenhouse case is almost 90% certain <laughs> to, to place you in one of those camps or the other. And that's just, that's unbelievable if we think about it, that we've allowed such politicization. And the only way that happens 
is in a winner-take-all society, which is wildly beyond the parameters of any law. We have a lawless, anarchistic government. In other words, people say, oh, anarchy. Well, we have a, we have a lawless government. It's just the rest of us who have to follow laws, and even those are imposed and enforced willy-nilly. Anarcho-tyranny, as Sam Francis called it. So, yeah. you know, we're already in a position where we understand these deep divisions. And so why does everything have to be one size fits all? Why does a vax mandate in New York City have to be the same as one in Alaska? Well, obviously, those are very different situations. There are people packed together in the same way in Manhattan and Alaska. So it's troubling. And it's also troubling the way we've taken Kyle Rittenhouse and turned that into, you know, a political show trial for political purposes and political ends. And I, I don't know how we fix this other than to sort of step back and take a look at each other and say, you know, look at Europe. There are lots of different countries there, and they all kind of make fun of each other. They all have stereotypes about each other, like the hardworking Germans and, oh, those, those Greeks, you know, and the Greeks think the Germans are uptight. I mean, but nonetheless, they don't go to war with each other. They trade with each other. They travel to each other's countries. I'm not so sure that that would be the worst thing here. All right. I'm going to ask you a final question, given that you're the president of the Mises Institute. What would you say to somebody who says, look at this situation we face in the U.S. today? The Kyle Rittenhouse thing is deeply symbolic of very, very profound differences. And we have a society that is barely functioning at this point in, in some ways. You've got the vaccine thing, which is now going to creep into schools and into you know various aspects of life. Personally, I think they're reaching too far with the child vaccinations because I think there are a lot of parents who are going to resist that. But all the same, it's vaccine mandates where I personally think if there hadn't been the state-led hysteria in the response, I don't think there'd be vaccine mandates right now. Might not even be vaccines. I don't even know. But this is surely state-driven. So even if it seems like a, quote, voluntarily adopted mandate, I don't believe that. Just no way that would have happened, in my opinion. But one issue after another, I mean, you got the BLM rioting, you got, again, critical race theory is not just some boomer concern. I mean, it sums up everything that's wrong with these lunatics. The law schools are hopeless. I mean, imagine the crazies there making major decisions in our society. We could go on and on with the catastrophes we're facing. The Mises Institute, which I love, it is my favorite place in the world. I mean, it absolutely is. I, I just, I'm so always so happy to be there and to participate in its programs. But couldn't somebody say that talking about prices and price theory and the history of economic thought and a lot of theoretical stuff like this is just misplaced at a time like this. Like this is not urgently necessary. What's urgently necessary is that we reassert ourselves and figure out a way to restore something resembling civilization. And this other stuff is just a bunch of intellectuals debating how many angels can dance on the head of a pin at a time when society is burning down. How do you defend the Mises <laughs> Institute from that? Well, I think that's a perfectly valid criticism. In other words, if uh, you're having a riot in your town, I'm not sure a 900-page book is what you need at that moment. So there's some validity to that. But I think we have to look at this holistically. We have to say, what civilization? What's property? What's justice? We can't just pluck these things out of air ad hoc. In other words, no ideology or no philosophy is in itself an ideology or philosophy of ad hocism. So no matter what your principles or lack thereof are, you're being guided by something. And hopefully that's not fools or evil people. So without an understanding of economics, the material reality in this country will devolve and devolve quickly. And so as bad as things are, what appears to be a lot of people at each other's throats, imagine if we had a severe economic crisis on top of that and all the scapegoating that would come with that. So first and foremost, when people say, well, this isn't really the time to be talking about economics, I say, well, you know, the material world is at this point the, the world that's keeping us together. It's not the political world. You know, it's the fact that we all have nice hot and cold running water and electricity and, and digital devices and energy and all kinds of things in our grocery stores. That's what's keeping us going. So that's economics. That's the stuff of life. And that goes to property. That goes to what happened in Kenosha. That's as vital 
to me as any political issue or cultural issue. So I don't agree with this idea of mere economics. But I understand it. I think that the world has changed. It's less philosophical. It's less intellectual maybe than ever. Eh, I don't know, maybe than ever in, in American history. And that's a challenge. We have to find people where we can. And I think in defense of the Mises Institute, we try to find them amongst the intelligent and well-meaning lay people of goodwill. We're not here to convince academia. You know, it, I saw an article in The Economist today. Most economists didn't see inflation coming. <laughs> you know, that, I mean, these people are clearly too far gone. And we're not trying to reach everyone. We're trying to give people a place to come where they can get the intellectual ammunition, where they can feel at home and they can understand that a better society is possible. And maybe we need to plant a flag and show the way for what's going to come out on the other side of this, which I hope, you know, looks uh, more like Liechtenstein uh, than um, some troubled third world country. So, you know, we can't give up. I think the Mises Institute is important. I think it's vital for especially a lot of young people but I get it. I mean, I certainly understand the impetus to go out there and say, hey, it's not time for this uh, human action stuff, Jeff. It's time for political action or it's time to go to your school board meeting or it's time to go to a protest or whatever. I'm absolutely 100 percent sympathetic to that and I get it. All right. Well, that's actually a very honest answer and I appreciate that. I'll just say I feel like there's room for everything. There's room for both. And there's even in the same person. Why, why can't you do both things in the same person? Because ultimately – at some point, you're going to want to rebuild. You're going to want to rebuild from sane, solid foundations, and you're going to need to have those at the time that you're starting to rebuild. We're going to need this knowledge, and we're going to need what it implies about how society should be arranged. I gave a talk at the opening of Mises U once linking Austrian economics with libertarianism, and Walter Block doesn't like that you know, because he says, oh, it's totally distinct. Austrian economics and libertarianism are two different things. One is positive, one's normative and all that. I said, okay, all right. But unless you are a misanthrope of the worst kind, when you study Austrian economics, it implicitly tells you, if you want human flourishing, do A, B, and C. And we need to know that. We need to know what A, B, and C are. And moreover, there is more to what we say, and I was just saying this in a recent episode, there's more to economics than just dollars and cents. A lot of people who say, oh, we don't have time for this economic stuff, they really have bought into the leftist caricature that economics is some, it's some kind of sham science that was developed in order to rationalize the actions of greedy people. Mm -hmm. And we don't really need that. We just need practical men coming up with, you know, kind of ad hoc ideas. We're here to say that's not how you can run a society. And there's just so much more to what economics is all about. It's about human cooperation on a grand scale. And that is of far more profound importance than quote unquote dollars and cents. So we can't neglect it. And it's a, not to mention, you can't be fighting the crazy people 24 hours a day. You'll burn yourselves out. And one thing that I honestly, believe it or not, I find relaxing. I find it relaxing to read authors in the Austrian school. I love to read their penetrating logic and their vision for society. I find it inspiring. We have to be inspired by something. Our, our faces can't be in the muck 24 hours a day. Let's look to what the ideal is for inspiration so we have the strength to go on. Absolutely, I couldn't have said it better. All right, good. Okay, so there, we have rehabilitated the Mises Institute after my completely unjust, but obviously devil's advocate inspired attack. Mises Institute, of course, can be found at Mises.org. That's M-I-S-E-S.org. Jeff here is the president, as I mentioned at the beginning. And I'm looking forward, I'm sorry to tell the listening audience that the event is sold out, but I am looking forward to seeing Jeff in Texas, December 4th, for a wonderful Ron Paul event that we're holding there. And I appreciate you having me as a part of that event. It helps when I invite myself over. I find I I crash a lot of events when I just invite myself over and it seems to work. Absolutely. All right, thanks, Jeff. Thanks, Tom. All right, folks, before we wrap up for today, let me tell you that we are, if you're listening to these episodes in order as they're being released, we are in the week of Black Friday. And that means a couple of things. The key thing it means is that it's my special over at Liberty Classroom. LibertyClassroom.com is my website, my dashboard university that teaches you the history and economics they kept from you. These are courses taught by me and by other faculty members I trust. 
and you can consume them in the car while you're driving, any time of day or night. And it's just an outstanding service and there's nothing else like it. There are courses where the libertarian movement has never done anything like them before. For example, I had Jeff Herbener, great economics professor, go through a typical college-level textbook in economics and critique every chapter from an Austrian school perspective. There's no such course anywhere. You can't just pick up a Rothbard book from the 1960s and respond to all these claims because he doesn't address some of them. Some of them hadn't come up yet. A lot of the concepts you see in a mainstream book are simply not covered in human action. So what would be the Austrian response? How are you supposed to know? Well, now you know, because I solicited that course and we got it. Well, I've got about 28 of those courses, and it's all forbidden knowledge. And we're slashing the lifetime membership, slashing it for Black Friday. So you got to put it on your Google calendar to hop on over to libertyclassroom.com and get yourself that discount. So that's the key thing. Also, if you like foreign languages, my friends at Rocket Languages, and I mean that literally, I actually know the people who started that company, Rocket Language is a great foreign language company. We have their Japanese course. My eldest daughter does, so we know it's great. They have their annual Black Friday. They take 60% off all the courses for Black Friday. So hop on over there, tomwoods.com slash rocket, and learn another language because eventually they are going to let you travel around the world again. You know, that is going to happen someday, and you'll know how to talk to people because you listen to Woods here and you took the opportunity to uh, take 60% off a language course. So libertyclassroom.com and tomwoods.com slash rocket. Those are your action items for this week. I'll see you next time. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit tomwoods.com to subscribe to the show for free and we'll see you next time. Like the sound of the Tom Woods Show? My audio production is provided by Podsworth Media. Check them out at podsworth.com.